All right, in this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at the story window inside of Motion Builder 5. This is a fabulous new feature that is super powerful and really, if nothing else, convinces you to run out and pick up a copy of Motion Builder. And this should definitely do the trick. This should do it because really, what you know, what is story? First of all, let me go ahead and get that out of the way. Story is a non-linear editor system that is going to allow you to control nearly every aspect of the animation in your scene quickly and easily. Now, for those of you who have worked with nonlinear editors before, you're going to feel completely at home with Story. For those of you who haven't, don't worry. You'll be able to pick it up in just a couple of minutes, and it will definitely speed up your workflow. What kind of things can you animate inside of Story? Well, nearly everything. You can animate uh, elements, characters, cameras, constraints. You can, activate, you can uh, animate commands for launching other programs inside of Motion Builder. And we're going to be demonstrating most of these here in the next few lessons. But first, what I want to do is take a quick walk around the UI of the story window, which you see down here. Starting up here in the left, we have the story mode button. Now, what this is, basically, a kill switch for story. It's an on and off button. Exactly. When this is activated, all animation that you do inside of story, using tracks and clips of animation, is going to be active. As soon as you click this off, any animation you do inside of here is not even read anymore. It doesn't exist, and all that is read is any animation you might have on the actual take down here inside your timeline. Next to this, we have the Story Mode menu, which is going to allow you to select either the Action or Edit areas of Story for playback. Now, what are those? This top area of Story that you see here is the Edit Track area. This is for controlling your shot tracks and basically when cameras are going to be active. So it's like your camera switcher. Down beneath that, we have the action track list. This is going to be all action inside your scene. Element animation, camera animation, character animation, uh, when constraints are going active, blending in between constraints, and so on and so on. Any kind of action in your scene will be within the various tracks inside of this area. This menu will allow you to choose which one of these two areas will be played back. Next to this, we have looping and scaling of clips for looping a clip over and over, such as like a run sequence. Let's say you have a, a short uh, walk cycle, which is maybe only 30 frames long, that is perfectly uh, cyclable. Now, for cyclable animation, uh, we do have a couple of VTMs that show you how you can create that inside of Motion Builder. If you were to create that animation and place it into a clip, you could use looping to just stretch that clip out, and it would just cycle over and over relatively. So if you had, like, your character maybe takes two steps, you stretch the clip out, your character would just start to walk right off the screen. And we'll, we might demonstrate that just a little bit later uh, in the next lesson. Uh, very cool, though. Now, if we click on this, we get clip scaling. Now, what this is going to allow you to do is to scale out the size of individual clips. In other words, it will slow down or speed up the animation. Exactly. It's just like scaling a, a series of keyframes, where if you scale them closer together, you speed up the animation. If you scale them apart, you slow down the animation. Next to this, we have clip snapping, which is going to allow clips to snap right up against each other as you slide them around here inside the editor. We have the clip razor for bisecting clips, which I'll be demonstrating a lot here in, uh, in future lessons. We have cut, copy, and paste for cutting, copying, and pasting clips. Uh, just self-explanatory. Exactly, just like in several other computer applications. Now, what I want to do is make a quick scene of a box being animated across our viewer, and I'm going to animate the box entirely inside of Story. So, first of all, let me right-click inside of my action track list, and we're going to see this nice context menu pop up. Now, I'm not going to be going over every single command inside of here, as most of them are self-explanatory, but down here on the bottom, we have time discontinuity. Now, this can be a little bit tricky the first time you hear it. Essentially, though, time discontinuity is going to allow you to have two separate timelines, one for your camera shots and one for your camera action. Now, what does that mean? If you Let's say you had a, an animation of a character like maybe doing some kung fu fighting moves, and he throws a really, really cool kick that you just really happen to like. With time discontinuity active, you can take a shot of that kick and show it three times in a row, back to back to back, without affecting your actual timeline. So it's like you're... Camera, your camera shots are on one timeline, your actual animation is on another. So it's like two separate worlds of time. It's a very cool feature. And we will be demonstrating a little bit later toward the end of this VTM. The other big thing I want to demonstrate here is all of the different types of tracks that you can insert into your track list, and there are a lot of them. 
We have generic animation. This is going to be for animating elements, such as cubes, props, lights. We have character animation for animating characters, as you might have guessed. We have camera animation, audio and video tracks for inserting audio and video. We have command tracks for showing, hiding models, launching other programs from within Motion Builder. And finally, constraint tracks where, that we can use to control when constraints are active, how constraints are blended in between each other, and so on. So with that, let me go ahead and bring in a generic animation track. And we're going to see some options pop up for it. I'll go over these here in just a second. But if we click on this track, we'll notice our main toolbar up here across the top extends. The first thing we're going to notice is the Auto Key button. This is going to allow us, uh, just like Auto Key and several other programs, we can uh, automatically place keys as we move the timeline and we change a value of a parameter. Just uh, be aware, though, you do have to place an initial keyframe to get this to work. After this, we have multiple clips, which is going to allow uh, each keyframe that you place to be on a separate clip, uh, if you need that to be active. We have several ghost options here for showing ghosts. Now, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with ghosts, they're a very awesome feature that is, dates all the way back to uh, previous versions of Motion Builder that basically show where different animations as far as motion capture are going to take place. And we're going to be playing with those a lot when we get into character animation. And finally, we have clip matching, which again is going to be a lot more pertinent when we get to character animation. Now, down here, our actual animation track. The first button we have is the, uh, the track options button. If I click on this, we have override and additive, and we have clip offset and pass through. These are different options that you can have for this particular clip, and I'll be demonstrating these a little bit as we go through. Next, we have ghosts and whether or not they're going to be active. You'll notice as soon as I activate this, the ghost options up here become highlighted, and you can switch these on and off for each individual clip. Next to this, we have animate. When animate is active, this track will accept keyframes. When it's not, this track will not accept keyframes. Very cut and dry, very simple. Next we have solo and mute. Now uh, these are two very common features that were found in several of the different tools inside of Motion Builder 4. Essentially, when solo is activated, only this track will be recorded if you were to plot this out to a take. If mute is activated, this track will be skipped when you plot out to a take. Down from that, we have the track content. This is going to control what aspect of our scene, what object, what element, if you will, is going to be controlled by this track. Now, just next to and slightly underneath the word track content, down here across the bottom, we have these three little dots, which you might not be able to see very well, you know, given the video compression. My mouse is over them right this second. What this means is that there are some more options that are hidden inside of this track. Now, if I drag this down, we'll see weight pop up. Now what weight is, is the amount of influence that this track is going to have over the object inside track content. Let me go ahead and get uh, all of these demonstrated now. Firstly, I need some sort of object in the scene. So I'm going to bring in... The Almighty Cube. Oh yes, and we'll go ahead and scale it up so that everybody can see. And this is just for a simple demonstration of the story uh, window as far as animation is concerned. So. Uh, once again, this is not going to be like a super exciting, explosive kind of animation, but it should get the point across as to what several of these options are. Firstly, I need this cube to be down here inside of the track content so that this track knows it's influencing this cube. There's a couple of ways to do this. One, I can click on this browse button here, and I can actually drag it out of my scene, double-click cube, and it'll pop right in. Or there's another way, which I actually prefer. With the cube selected, I can alt-drag it down here inside the, the track content field, and you'll see it pops right in. You have to love that drag-and-drop interface. Yeah, it's very simple and All right. convenient. <laughs> so from here, let's go ahead and use Story to animate this cube just a little bit. Now, just a quick note. You'll notice after we get the cube down here as part of our track, if I come up here to our viewer and try to move our cube, we don't get anything. That is because all motion for this cube is influenced by our track. So let's go ahead and animate this cube moving about our scene just a little bit. To do this, to get any kinds of keyframes uh, key into this track, I need to activate my animate button. So now with this turned on, I can animate my, uh, my cube. So let's go ahead and place an initial keyframe. Now at frame zero, our box is going to be right here in the middle of our viewer. Let's slide forward, say to, oh, I don't know, frame 75, about halfway through. And we'll move the cube over here. And let's place another keyframe. And we'll notice, check this out. We I kind of filled in that area. Exactly. We have this red bar here. Now, what this is, this is an actual clip. 
This entire area is a track. This is a clip within this track. So you can place multiple clips inside of a track. Exactly. And we'll be doing that a little bit later uh, throughout the, the different lessons that we include over story. Right now, I want to go ahead and extend this clip to cover the end of the animation. So I'll drag out here to frame 150. And now I'll just move my box over here to the opposite side of the screen. And we'll place key again. So now I have another keyframe in place. And if I scrub back through, you'll see we actually have animation. Very cool. So, pretty cool. We uh, see how we can place uh, animation into a clip using keyframing by activating our animation button. Now, we have this clip in place. What can we do with it? Let's go ahead and demonstrate a few things. First of all, I can move the clip. And as I move it, all I'm doing is changing the time at which this animation takes place. You'll notice now, with the clip slid forward up to about frame 61, as I move uh, the time indicator here before frame 60, I get nothing. As soon as we get to frame 60, the animation actually begins. So we've changed the timing of the animation just by moving the clip. Also, I can scale this clip down if I want to speed up the animation. So if I hit play now, really quick, and then it's over long before the, uh, the timeline is finished. Or I can scale it back out to any size that I like. So let's go ahead and undo that to get it back to its original size. So you can see how we can move clips, we can scale them, manipulate them in several different ways. Also, let me take a second and demonstrate our clip razor. If we have a clip selected, we can click on the clip razor, and I've just cut this into two separate clips of animation. So you can see here, the first part, we we'll just watch in here in our clips. As we drag through, there's our box sliding over, and then here we have nothing. It's just blank then the rest of our clip takes place because now this is a separate clip. So you kind of put a short pause in the middle. Exactly. Uh, essentially that's what I did. But what I, uh, what I want to get across is that I have taken this one clip of animation and cut it up into two. Let me go ahead and undo that and make this back into a single clip. Now there's one more thing that I want to uh, demonstrate as far as how these uh, tracks are working. We can right click on a track and we can insert a subtrack of animation. Now, we have two different flavors for subtracks. We have override and additive. Now, these are kind of self-explanatory. Override is going to override any animation that might be contained in, a, in the previous track, and additive will simply add to that animation. For now, let me go ahead and set up an additive track. And for, we don't really need our edit track area, so I'm just going to scoot it up out of the way so we can actually see our action area a little bit better. Now if I bring this down, you can see that the track content already includes our cube because this is a subtrack of our original track. Let's rewind back to the beginning. And what I want to do is use this track to make our cube kind of bob up and down. So I'll deactivate animation for this upper track, activate animation for the subtrack, and now rather than place keyframes individually as I go along just by moving the timeline, clicking key, moving the timeline, moving the box, clicking key, and so on and so on, I'm going to activate auto key to speed up the animation process. So let me place my initial keyframe, and then we'll drag along, and you'll see that our first part of animation, our initial clip, is playing through. Our box is moving side to side. So we'll come forward to about, uh, let's see, we're about frame 23, and we'll just move the box up in the air. And you'll notice, since I have auto key on, a keyframe was automatically placed. Now, after that, the box automatically snaps back down, right back down to the ground. It's because it's past the end of this particular clip. And I'll get to that here in just a second. Now, let's move the box down a little bit. Just complete the pattern. I'll drag forward, move up, drag forward, move down, and so on, and so on. And we'll just go ahead and fast forward to the end, and so on. So now if I rewind and hit play, we have two separate tracks of, I'm sorry, two separate clips of animation which are being played at the exact same time. One inside of our main track, one inside of our subtrack. So you can see how we have animation being added through an additive track. Now if I click on my options for my subtrack, I can come down here to override. Now look what happens. As soon as I do that, the box jumps back to the center of its animation. Essentially what's happening now is that all of the animation in this upper red clip is being overridden by what's going on inside of this, uh, this track. So now if I hit play, all we get is the up and down motion. So there's a good example of 
override versus additive, where one is overriding animation, the other is adding to it. Now, real quickly, I do want to demonstrate clip offset and pass through before I close this lesson. So let me go ahead and switch up here to clip offset first. And I'm going to scale down my up and down motion clip down here inside of my subtrack. So right now, I'm set to clip offset. And really, to, make, to really drive this point home, let me just show one more thing. Uh, I don't mean to bounce around too much here, but what I'm going to do is right click, and I'm going to insert another generic animation track. I'm going to take this clip that we have up here, and I'm going to drag it down here inside of our animation track, and then delete out our subtrack. So now, let's go ahead and just hit delete, delete selected item. So now I have two separate tracks, and I can alt-drag this cube down inside the track content of our, sep our second track, two separate tracks that are both influencing this cube. Right now, this uh, second track is override, so you'll see that it is overriding our animation. But you'll notice that when I get to the end of this particular clip, all animation stops. Everything is completely done. Our box completely quits moving no matter how I drag back and forth right here. That is because this track is set to clip offset. If I set this to pass through instead, what happens is, in the case of an override track like we have here, we have the override action taking place of our box moving up and down. As soon as we reach the end of this clip, Motion Builder is going to look up to the next track for the bit of animation. So you can see we jump right up and continue with the animation from up here. So you can see the difference between clip offset and override, where clip offset causes all animation to stop, and uh, pass through will allow us to move here. I think I said that the wrong way. It should be uh, clip offset and pass through and not clip offset and override. Anyway, so let me go ahead and set this back to an additive track, and we can see how we're adding to the animation and then sliding back in. I'll scale this back up. So just as a brief overview, we've covered a, a great deal of the UI of the story window. We've talked about uh, different types of tracks that can be inserted. We talked about our, our track options as far as uh, what they allow us to do for override, additive, clip offset, and pass through. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and draw this lesson to a close. So thanks, everyone.